right, welcome back. Today we're looking at the Authenticals, Authentico Presidencies. Authenticals just is, means basically authentic, the authentic presidents. Whether they were authentic is a whole different argument. So Batista under the Constitution was obligated to step down, which is remember when, when Machado, there was a lot of revolts, he did not step down. He was constitutionally obligated to step down. He did not, and that's why that coup happened against Machado, right? But now fast forward, now to Batista. He's obligated to step down. He does in 1944. Uh, Grau, the guy that basically was a no-no um, after that little revolution against him, he's back with his Authenticos, with the party Authenticos. And it was very obvious that he was going to win again. I don't know why, but it was very obvious that he was going to win uh, Batista leaves Cuba, though, with a big portion of, Cu of the money that Cuba had, the Cuban treasury, and that leaves Grau financially handicapped in his presidency and unable to do much. Um, just a little side note, Batista was still involved in politics as an absent senator in 1948. Next slide. So during this time, the Cuban political landscape had changed. You start to see other political parties rise. You start to see this one um, by Eddie uh, Chivas, his party known as the Orthodoxos, right? They were basically communists, and they were all an alternative to the Communist Party in Cuba. And the reason why they didn't join the Communist Party in Cuba is because they that the Communist Party was stained because they associated themselves and supported Batista, as you remember in the last lecture, right? Um, they kind of just labeled anybody who opposed Batista as a fascist. And so they're like, well, that's, you, you know, this man, but uh, Batista is clearly a capitalist and he's clearly not doing a good job or whatever. So we got to form our own party. And that's what they do, known as the Orthodoxos. Fidel Castro, this is where he comes in, is attracted to this party and he joins this party. OK, um, next one. So. Now that Grau is president again, the, you know, the corruption and the violence continues. Nobody's surprised about that. He appointed polit political gangs to high government positions. The Authenticos were given a private army that acted as their bodyguards and a police force as well that protected them and kind of served their best interests, right? Uh, he abandoned any social economic reforms to gain the support of the wealthy businessmen and, you know, of U.S. corporations. Everything, every move that he made was not for the best interests of the common people of Cuba. It was more for the wealthy people and the United States. Uh, the violence and the bribery continues against Grau's opponents. And if his opponents were not going to stay calm under that violence and bribery, murder was used. So now you start to see people getting murdered like crazy. Um, his su successor after Grau is, you know, done with his presidency is uh, this other authentical man called Carlos Socarras. Um, he continued the same pathway as the Grau administration, but this one is somehow even worse and is even more polarizing, more corrupt, more violent, and more democ uh, undemocratic. It's labeled as that the most undemocratic, corrupt, violent administration since 1901, which is around the Platt Amendment was signed, right? Next one, pause if you need to. So, um, Batista's coup, um, comes in again, March 1952. There was an election that was happening in this time, but it was very intense, highly contested, and the Authenticos with Socarras, uh, Batista, and the Orthodoxos with with the the Orthodoxos party with, with the leader Chivas, they're all basically running. And with the Authenticos and the Orthodoxo, sorry, Orthodoxos having widespread support this pushed Batista into third place. So it's obvious he's not going to win. He's in third place. Uh, the U.S. Mafia attempted to protect protect their interests by bribing um, the Socarras, Socarras uh, candidate into stepping down and letting Batista win. They gave that man about 250K. Um, in 1951, Chivas, basically from the Orthodoxos, announced his suspicion that Batista was planning a coup. And for some reason, he shot himself on live air. I don't... Your book does not give me any details on that. I can, you know, he shoots himself on live air. But he was right, because seven months later, he was proved correct that Batista was planning a coup um, to kind of overthrow everybody and step into power. 
So March 10th, 1952, Batista and those loyal to him in the army staged a coup. The coup was met with very little resistance from the for the following reasons. One, Batista falsely claimed that Socarras was also planning a coup of his own. Two, Batista promised to hold free elections in 1954. Three, Cuba, the Cuban pool, uh, public, the Cuban public was wary of the Authentico's corruption because you know Grau had just came back and shown that um, Socarras was even more corrupt, and so they're like, all right, well we'll just come back. Life wasn't that horrible under Batista compared to these guys, so they're like, all right, come back, I guess. Uh, Batista supported the uh, was supported by the military, the police, and the secret police, the BRAC, the BRAC who was in charge of just kind of like suppressing all communists and like any leftist support. And five, the Cold War is like starting now. And so you had, um, the Cold War had helped uh, because of his pro-business rhetoric and, you know, this guaranteed U.S. support. It's like, oh, Batista's not a commie. Okay, we're going to help him out. So it's just little resistance, a lot of help, and it just kind of worked out for Batista to step in. Next one. So by 1954, and there's nothing to write in this one. In this one, by 1954, the U.S. government had been using the CIA to install U.S. friendly dictatorships in Latin America. So now Batista's in charge, right? Batista's in charge. So Batista's like, okay, we know what the United States is doing with the CIA. They're overthrowing, you know, democratic leftist governments and implementing uh, right wing di dictatorships in Latin America. I don't want that to happen to me. So I don't want to be like seeming like a too much of a socialist. So I'm going to work abandon anything that has to do with like working reforms or anything at all. Right. So he does that. He abandons all of that to not seem like too much of a socialist. He used corruption to maintain a grip of power. He used the secret police, the BRAC, to crush his opponents. And Batista became just another imperialist oppressor in the eyes of the Cuban people, right? Next slide. Again, nothing to write on this one. This is where you start seeing Castro emerge. Um, Castro's strongest indications of his ideology came from his early uh, cons you know, consistent critique of corruption of Cuba's government. So he sees all of this corruption as he's growing up, right? He's growing up under all of this as a child and as a young adult. Um, and he's like consistently critiquing it. In, 19, in 1950, he completed his law studies and declared, uh, dedicated his practice to defending the victimized workers, slum dwellers, detainees, students, and poor people in general, um, which is also why he made like no money because he was just defending a bunch of poor people. Um, this is important because it just gives you a little bit of his like background in terms of, of where he's coming from mentally. Um, also, Castro comes from very humble backgrounds. His dad did not like recognize him as his son um because he was like a bastard child but we'll get to that eventually so the emergence of castro just to kind of continue that um he like i said he was drawn to the orthodoxos but only because of their ideology he thought the ideology was good but not because of their tactics he thought the orthodoxos were doing it all wrong um, because they, the Ortodoxos advocated for passive resistance is like, oh, like, let's just hold a little rally and just that's it. But young people in the Ortodoxos are like, no, we got to do more. Like, we got to, like, actually use military, like, tactics and, like, come in with guns and do our own little revolt. So he used militant language and preached for glorious nationalistic violent struggle towards freedom. He thought the only way to gain freedom from your oppressors is to actually start you know, this nationalistic pro-Cuban, like, um, revolution. And if that means violence, then that means violence, right? Castro launched a legal battle against Batista's undemocratic um, seizure of power, but Castro lost this battle due to the, you know, corruption siding with Batista, right? The entire government of Cuba is corrupt under Batista at this time because of that coup. Castro quickly realizes that he made a mistake and should not have done that, and he's going to be labeled as an enemy of the state, so he has to flee. He goes into hiding because he's going to be assassinated, um, and that's what he does. The next thing I'm going to show you in class, once we come back from all of this, is a video that kind of demonstrates um, Castro's actions towards revolution. Okay, The first plan, in t the first step in, in kind of achieving that goal of liberating Cuba, but that's it for now.